rate, uh, so I thought I would talk to you all today about, uh, about adolescent sleep and this issue of adolescent sleep and schools and insufficient sleep. Uh, and again, with as, as introduced, you know, there are a couple of brain-based systems that are involved in helping to regulate sleep. Of course, we do many behaviors that change our sleep and often make it less good, shall we say. Uh, but one of our seminal findings has to do with clocks, the biological clock in adolescence. So this cartoon just shows that, you know, an adolescent whose brain clock and the brain clock doesn't really look like this. Uh, it's a paired nucleus deep within the brain. It's sort of, if you had a geographic center of the brain, that's where your master clock lives. And, uh, you know, you can see, well, there's this uh, inappropriate connection between the school systems clocks and the adolescent's brain clock. And so we found a number of years ago that one of the things that changes during adolescent development is the timing of this clock and the way that your phase position gets a little later as you pass through puberty. And with that in mind, it's not just your, uh, you know, your eating and your activity and so forth that change. And it's not just, you know, that your bedtime gets later, but your time of waking up gets later, your natural innate time. And so that's a challenge that really gets in the way uh, for adolescents getting enough sleep when they have to be in school so early. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues who has an early teenage son on Thursday said to me, you know, all of a sudden he's no longer happy to go to bed or happy to get up in the morning. And he's there, it's like, it's like a light switch was turned on. So this is, you know, it's not every teen, but for a lot of families, parents will see this as a, you know, a sea change that happens very abruptly in their youngsters. And so <clears throat> the other side of this that uh, was mentioned is, so we have our clock, but we also have the brain systems that regulate how much sleep we need and how sleep pressure accumulates while we're awake and then gets dispelled or recovers when we're asleep. Our research has also shown that that process itself changes not in how fast recovery occurs. So we think, oh, the amount of sleep that's necessary isn't really changing, but how fast sleep pressure builds up. So this consequence is it's actually easier for the adolescents to stay awake longer, but they still need the same amount of sleep. So when, and then of course, not our biology, but also the brain is impacted by all of these other things that go on and including screen time and, and social interactions that teens will prefer to do at night and keep them from sleeping. And so in combination, sleep kind of gets squeezed out of their lives uh, when they have to be in school early. So that's a, that's a real challenge for teens and families to negotiate. And, and finally, you know, the state of California before COVID hit had passed a, uh, a law legislation to have schools not start before 8.30 a.m. for both middle school and high school. So that's all, you know, the, the monkey wrench has been COVID and remote learning and virtual platforms. And we have a little project we're working with a team to see the effects of those different kinds of school scheduling on, on uh, adolescent sleep. It's, it's an interesting time to be involved in this field. And I know Rhode Island teenagers today 
tomorrow, this week, those who are going back to school, real school, and have to be there early. And it's like, but wait, we turned our clocks ahead. And <clears throat> it's a huge challenge, especially this week. So the adjustment will take a while. And I think everybody, um, you know, knows that. So I'll stop there and field any questions that may come in. Thank you, Dr. Cascadon. Uh, I have a question um, regarding uh, sleep and students. Uh, are there any, are you aware of any um, real life, real world examples of uh, school performance being um, uh, changed or improved uh, by changing the, uh, the start time? Oh, yes, yeah. There are quite a few, actually. But, it, you know, what's interesting is that it's so hard to get a handle on the academic performance of teenagers because every school and even every year will have different approaches. But one of my favorite studies happened uh, in England where they did a sort of ABA kind of study where they had the baseline information and then they delayed the school start time for one year and then they changed it back. And their outcome measure was the national testing service. So their, you know, their control group was the entire uh, nation of teens. And they indeed saw that those scores on the nationwide testing were much higher, i.e. better, in the time when school start time was delayed than before or after. So, it, and in comparison, to the students who didn't have that uh, change occur. So, you know, and there are other things people have looked at. One of what I feel, you know, some people are there, well, so what? They have to learn and grow up and, you know, adjust like we all do. But there's pretty much evidence now that changing the school start time to a later time also minim diminishes the number of automobile crashes with teen drivers and some of those crashes have lasting impact on the kids and some are uh, fatal. So there are kind of big issues that can emerge. And I, just one final thing, I, I'm not good at sound bites. So, <laughs> but one final thing is um, what I think is kind of one of the most important findings uh, was in an educational economics journal. And it turns out the kids who benefited most in terms of their grades and their performance in school were the kids who came from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. And so we forget sometimes, you know, when we live in a lovely place like Rhode Island that, you know, there are challenges that many families have and that teens have. So a teenager, whose both parents or single parents are working one or two jobs uh, and they miss the school bus because they overslept, that's it, they miss the day. Whereas, uh, you know, a teen from a more affluent family, you know, oh, you woke up late, well, I'll drive you to school today, the, you know, the mom says. And so they don't miss that entire day. So there really are many you know, we don't think about some of these sort of systemic challenges uh, that are in our society. And, and you know, it, it's, it's really interesting, the fact that uh, our school uh, schedule uh, really responds to, to a different time. Uh, you know, uh, an agricultural time, not a, uh, not, not a, not the time that we live in today and other countries are doing it very differently. Yeah, I mean, I've seen some recent science coming out of some Latin American countries where, you know, it was interesting. One of the papers, I think it was from Ecuador, talked about the teens and the way their families live, where they actually have a meal late in the evening for the family, you know, the family gathers. And so that makes, you know, that's a different kind of social challenge on the kids sleep. And again, they benefit if they're on the group that's going to school later. And, uh, 
Yeah, it's a, it's so interesting and in all of the components and nuances and the way we organize our lives. And as you say, now that we're on daylight saving time, midnight, that word is no longer accurate because the middle of darkness on mm. Saturday was midnight, but tonight is not midnight. It's 1 a.m. So it's, you know, we no longer really live by um, the geophysical earth and planetary orbits and so forth. But uh, yeah. And our brain suffer as a result. Victoria, we have any questions from the audience? We do. We have one question um, that says, how does your clock change after high school or college? It's interesting, there's some lovely work from a European colleague who, who actually wrote a paper uh, that he called the biological signal for the end of adolescence. And so his data, and this is you know, cross-sectional data from thousands of people uh, giving uh, their sort of, their sleep schedules. And what he found was that during adolescence, this uh, phase goes later and later and later, but then there's a tipping point, you know, around age 20, early 20s, where it starts going earlier and earlier. So, uh, I, you know, behavior and biology aren't always joined at the hip, but I think it's a pretty good um, view of what may be going on as kids get a little older and mm -hmm. pass into other phases of life. And not to mention us old folks where that curve keeps getting a little earlier and earlier, which yeah, doesn't make daylight saving time transition no. <laughs> any easier. <laughs> and there seems to be, a, is there a reduced need for sleep um, later in life or, or, is it, or is that just sort of a behavioral thing that is not <laughs> in line with biology? That's a very, uh, complex issue and it's still fraught with a little bit of, uh, uh, I guess, challenges in the field and a little disagreement, but it does appear that the need for sleep does decline uh, in older age. And, and we don't know why, we don't know how that is, but we do know, I mean, I, one of the things to emphasize, which I think is particularly important uh, for sleep and aging is that we still need our sleep and we need to get the sleep we need mm -hmm. because one of the important newly discovered uh, functions of sleep, if you will, is that it, uh, it engages a system that clears toxins from the central nervous system. So it's like the, you know, the cleanup crew for our brains and there's some evidence that the kinds of things it's cleaning out are the kinds of things that are involved in these sort of late age uh, dementias and problems that occur. And so, you know, you, you ignore your good sleep at your peril. Right. So we have a couple of questions coming in now. Um, one question says, is there research on how depression and anxiety impact adolescent sleep? and their ability to wake up early in the morning for school? That's a great question. And, you know, we always think there's a two-way street between those mental health issues and sleep and that uh, improved sleep will improve mental health, you know, issues and poor mental health will make sleep worse. And so there is evidence that for that, what was suggested that uh, well, implied was that anxiety and, and depression, especially when very serious, will challenge teens even further to get up in the morning. But I caution to say that, you know, the street runs the other direction as well. And if we don't, it's another thing we know, if we're not paying attention, especially for teens getting adequate sleep, they will show more greater signs of anxiety and depression. And, and you know, you worry about when that flips into um, sort of impulsive behavior that can lead to suicide. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question here is, can you train your mind to need less sleep? Example, six hours per night versus eight to nine. And I can see the applications of this if you had a job that required you maybe to, to reduce your need for sleep. The short answer is no. <laughs> That's what I thought. You know, I mean, there is a kind of an allostatic process that can go on and that can and then does show up, but that may be in the regulation of sleep. So in those core functions, but in the outputs and in our performance and in our cognitive capacities, no. And, you know, the other thing that comes up a lot is, well, what if I, you know, still get eight hours or even fewer, but, but sleep in two hour chunks around the clock? Let me just say no. <laughs> it's not like a bank account. <laughs> no, it is in some ways. I mean, you don't want to overdraw for a long time. And, you know, and there's also the binging that a lot of people will do binge sleeping on the weekends. And that just makes your sleep irregular. And there's plenty of evidence now for metabolic uh, consequences of sleep irregularity, as well as so too little sleep, the regular sleep, poorly timed sleep. I mean, shift workers, I feel so bad for them because some of them are, you know, again, there's a sort of societal bias that the people working shifts are more often the people who are at the lower ends of the of society and they have no way out it's just you know if they want a job this is the job that's available and that's really a challenge and this 24 7 uh, society we live in really has a number of these hidden challenges that we don't always think about yeah. it's also tough for us uh, obstetrician gynecologists there you go <laughs> oh man <laughs> well I, hopefully the pandemic will help shed some light on this issue you know we have learned that we can survive working in a less you know active world so hopefully that will be one of the ramifications uh, another question here is what is the effect if any of interrupting sleep at night or changing from a recliner to a bed going to the bathroom etc i don't know i mean you know what we know is you know, interruptions happen and things go on. I mean, the worst case scenario, speaking of our OBGYN, is the next step, for, which is the first step for parenting uh, with a newborn and sleep is incredibly disrupted uh, for parents of newborns. I mean, that just is remarkable what happens to sleep. And again, there are downside consequences. But, you know, switching from your recliner to your bed probably doesn't cause much harm. You want to, you know, there are, now there's data that light may be as important of, uh, as anything, lights at night. But, um, I mean, what that tells me, though, is that individual hasn't really planned sleep. <laughs> they just fell asleep and now, and not in their bed, and now they have to get up and actually trundle off to their bed. So, it's far better to have a plan for sleep uh, and not just wait until it overtakes you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and on that on that note, there are a couple of questions about screen time. And if you could just say a couple of words about what, what your opinions on screen time are before bedtime. Sure. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a couple of words. Uh, there's, again, there's a lot of myth out there oh as long as it's not blue light it's no problem wrong the the parts of your retina that uh, you know are specifically for blue light and do connect to this clock in the center of your brain also bring information from the other parts of your retina that are pulling in other wet uh, wavelengths of light and so it gets integrated so you know, it doesn't help just to wear your blue blockers or put the blue screen blockers on. It helps some, but it's not the, the cure. So, you know, the later you have it, it just if you could just put those things away, and turn them off. But you can still read a book, right? If reading a book is not bad. In the dark. So <laughs> if you're doing it with Braille. That's right. Uh, that's that, that could work. 
That's I, you know, I remember when I was a teen, I would read. I would read and read. I would stay up late reading. That was before, yes, we had our um, electronic devices. But I, again, it's this process that makes it easier to stay awake later. And then you get into the book or whatever it is that you're into. Maybe nowadays it's the video game that you're playing. And then, you know, it just sort of eats up uh, your time and your sleep time. I have a question that I, that I know is from a middle schooler uh, that doesn't have school today that says, how come the early school time is not a problem for elementary school students? Well, the thing is that those changes that happen to the brain systems that push sleep later because of the brain change, they happen in adolescence. And so most younger kids are protected for early, not super early. I'm not offer, offering recommendations that even the, you know, the youngest kids should go to school super early. I think that's a mistake, especially in the 21st century, uh, where it really is hard for families to organize things uh, well. But, but little kids, you know, they pop up in the morning with a song in their heart and a smile on their lips uh, and, you know, hit adolescence and that just stops happening. Mm -hmm. And the younger kids, they can't fight off sleep in the evening because that pressure to sleep builds up at a much higher rate, much faster rate. So, you know, the biology is different, I guess is the main uh, response to that theory. Mm -hmm. I have one interesting question that has to do with migraines. Um, is there any link between lack of sleep and migraines? I don't know the biological link, but there certainly is a link that many people report. If they, you know, when they lose sleep, they're more likely to have a migraine. And if they can fall asleep during the migraine, it actually will, you know, get better a little faster than if they just keep doing what they're doing. So there's a link, but I don't think the real biology or neurophysiology of that link is clear. Well, our next speaker is going to be an expert on migraines because she suffers from them. So we'll be able to ask her as well. Oh, great. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of questions and I, Pablo, you stop me because you're, you're, you're the boss here, but there's, there's one interesting question about uh, the, the COVID vaccine um, and whether there has been any evidence of the COVID vaccine impacting amount and or nature of dream activity. Oh, I haven't seen any of that evidence. Neither have I've I. certainly heard from friends that the second dose knocks them for a loop. <laughs> and for that reason, because they get like acute flu symptoms, it, it interferes with their sleep. But I hadn't heard uh, that people are dreaming more when they get the vaccine. That's cool. I'll have to look into that. Well, yeah, I'll, right? look, I'll, I'll look into it as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fiskadden. This was really very, very interesting. And uh, you definitely did not put us to sleep uh, this afternoon. <laughs> so. <laughs>